The Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson affair is one of the most famous scandals of early American history. The story first hit major news outlets in the 1990s, shortly after the Bill Clinton scandal. The history goes that Thomas Jefferson, writer of the Declaration of Independence, a prominent president and one of the most famous American founding fathers, had an affair with his 14-year-old slave, Sally Hemings. According to Google, the affair produced up to six Jefferson Hemings children. Now some of you may be thinking, yeah, 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 I know this. My history teacher already told me about it. Hamilton told me about this. But what if I told you that the Jefferson Hemings affair is actually not recently discovered history, but 200-year-old gossip? Don't believe me? Good. That means I get to prove it to you. Roll film! So where does this story start? Historians had actually heard about the Jefferson Hemings affair since Thomas Jefferson's presidency. The only thing was that most historians disregarded it because the source for the history came from a bitter alcoholic who happened to be a journalist at the time of Jefferson's presidency. But we'll get to him later. The important thing to know was that historians decided to dredge up this little minor detail from Jefferson's past in 1998. What was so significant about this year? <coughs> That's right. Clinton was up because of an illicit affair that we won't delve too deep into. Now this kind of stuff was much less acceptable back then than it is today, because it made people wonder, if a man can't be faithful to the oath he made to his own wife, how is he supposed to keep his oath to the American people? Needless to say, the Democrats were definitely under some pressure for this scandal. So, someone decided it was time to use the advent of DNA to see if that affair rumor about Jefferson was true. So here's how the new history went when all the research was said and done. Sally Hemings was a slave belonging to Thomas Jefferson and served as a maid to the Jefferson daughters. At 14, she was taken to France with Mr. Jefferson's daughters, where Mr. Jefferson had easy access to her. Over her time at the Jefferson home, she bore five children. Through the science of DNA in 1998, the journal Science presented irrefutable and science-backed DNA data that showed that Thomas Jefferson fathered at least two of Sally Hemings' children. Also, the oral history of the Hemings' descendants agreed that Thomas Jefferson was the father of at least some of Sally Hemings' children. And as if that were not enough, the newspapers during Thomas Jefferson's administration reported that Thomas Jefferson had fathered multiple children by Hemings. And just like that, once this information was released, the national newspapers flooded with the story that Thomas Jefferson had an affair with his own slave. And President Clinton didn't look so bad after that. After all, if one of the most upstanding founding fathers of America had an affair, that must make President Clinton's affair okay. Right? That's sarcasm. Two wrongs don't equal a right. But now that the heated politics of the 90s are out of the way, let's enter the modern age and give this history a fresh investigation. We'll go over the evidences against and for Thomas Jefferson. First, the DNA. Two, the oral history from the Hemings family. And three, the old newspaper story that started this whole mess. And we'll get to the alcoholic journalist guy, I promise. He's still important to this story. Okay, DNA crash course. So in order to connect a father's DNA to his descendants, you need a Y chromosome from a male descendant. This is because from one male generation to the next, that part of the DNA remains pretty much unchanged. One problem with that. Jefferson didn't have a male descendant. Only girls survived his lineage. So where are they going to get this Y chromosome to connect the modern Hemings descendants DNA to Jefferson DNA? Well, fortunately, Jefferson's uncle, Field Jefferson, had a male line that had remained intact. Instead of using Thomas Jefferson's DNA line, they took his uncle Field Jefferson's descendants' DNA and tested that. And it is true, they found that a Jefferson had fathered one of Hemings' children, Eston. But did you catch that? A. Jefferson. DNA science couldn't specifically connect the Hemings to Thomas Jefferson. It could only connect the Hemings' DNA 
to a Jefferson, and there were 26 male Jeffersons in Thomas Jefferson's family. So that means 26 possible fathers for Sally Hemings' children. But I can hear you through your phone now. You're thinking, why couldn't the father be Thomas Jefferson? After all, he is still in the DNA grouping. It certainly could be him, but it could also be the other 25. Fortunately, a team of 13 PhD researchers from America's most prestigious universities investigated which Jefferson could have fathered Hemings' children. And just to check for bias, these researchers were all on different sides of the Jefferson-Hemings affair situation. Based off of who frequently visited Thomas Jefferson's home at Monticello, they determined that 10 Jeffersons, including Thomas Jefferson, would have had access to Sally. But interestingly, they found out that Thomas Jefferson wasn't a very good candidate for a few reasons. First, Thomas Jefferson did not frequent the slave quarters where the deed could have taken place. However, others did, such as Randolph Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's younger brother. One of Thomas Jefferson's slaves wrote in his memoir, that Randolph Jefferson would freely socialize in the slave quarters, dancing halfway into the night. So it would be rather biased to say that someone who didn't visit the slave quarters, such as Thomas Jefferson, would be a more likely suspect than someone who was well known for visiting the slave quarters, such as Randolph Jefferson. Also, an exchange of letters shows that Randolph was invited to visit Monticello shortly before Eston would be conceived, and Eston is the only child that can be proven to have Jefferson DNA. So it's a little weird that Thomas Jefferson, who had access to Sally for her entire life, would suddenly decide in her mid-thirties to do the deed with her. And the researchers who released a follow-up study in 2000 had been very emphatic about their findings and said that the case against some of Thomas Jefferson's relatives appeared significantly stronger than the case against him. Essentially, the initial DNA findings had been misrepresented by news outlets, and many of the same news outlets that boldly declared the Jefferson affair as DNA proven quietly printed retractions. So, what about the Hemings family oral history? For years, the Hemings said they were descended from Thomas Jefferson, but they also said that later, in order to keep the children from being racially profiled, they were descended from Randolph Jefferson, which is kind of weird. I mean, I don't know how which white guy you're descended from affects your racial profiling, but okay. Overall, the oral history is a bit weird. Originally, the Hemings' descendants said that Thomas Hemings was Thomas Jefferson's illegitimate child, but as we said before, DNA testing shows that only Eston has any Jefferson DNA. Thomas has no Jefferson DNA. The source of this oral tradition is Madison Hemings, another of Sally's children, who was quoted in a newspaper saying that Thomas Jefferson began an affair with Sally in France that produced Sally's firstborn Thomas. But again, as the DNA testing shows, Thomas has no Jefferson DNA. Which means there were no Hemings children with Jefferson DNA produced around the time Madison Hemings claims there were. Therefore, Madison Hemings was either lying or misinformed. At about this point, you might be asking yourself, if the evidence for the entire Hemings-Jefferson affair is so low, how did the rumor even get started? Well, let's go back over 200 years ago to that journalist we talked about at the beginning. Meet James T. Callender, the historically notorious journalist who started this whole thing. He was originally a refugee from Britain where he had gotten himself into deep trouble for writing his political views, which were quite strong, even by American standards. But Americans being Americans, and you know our love of free speech, when he arrived with his children on America's shores in 1793, Americans welcomed him. Immediately, Callender aligned himself with Thomas Jefferson's party and began ardently attacking Jefferson's opponents. Only, his articles were pretty much just defamatory opinion pieces with no actual facts. He even attacked George Washington, and if you spend any amount of time on this channel, you'll know I take that personally. Anyway, his careless writing eventually got him fined and imprisoned for nine months under the federal sedition law. During this time, he tried to get Jefferson to bail him out, figuring that because he had written against Jefferson's opponents, Jefferson would be more than willing to help. He wasn't. At this point, Callender's writings were just so belligerent that it was a nuisance to be associated with him. So Jefferson ignored Callender, but still sent him monetary donations because, you know, the guy still had kids to support. Also, when Jefferson became president shortly afterwards in 1801, he deemed the sedition law unconstitutional and removed it. Plus, he said all people who had been affected by it should have their fines returned to them, meaning Callender would be released and his money returned. But here's where things 
blow up. The sheriff in charge of Callender's fine refused to pay the fine back. He ignored direct orders from the Secretary of State, James Madison, to do so. Now, Callender doesn't know this, so he assumes Jefferson is doing this to him on purpose. And he made such a big deal over it that Madison and Monroe even discussed it in correspondence. Madison saying, Callender, I find, is under a strange error on the subject of his fine and in strange humor in consequence of it, which is a polite old American way of saying he's being a little pimple. But by this point, Callender was claiming that Jefferson owed him for all the years he had written against his enemies. Meanwhile, Jefferson was having no luck with the sheriff on Callender's fine, so he decided to pay it out of his personal funds. However, this did not stop Callender's political and personal attacks on Jefferson, Jefferson's constituents, and anyone else politically associated with him. He wrote pieces that basically read like tea time gossip, with multiple inaccuracies such as insinuating that Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings began their affair on the boat to France. Procreating in this way would have been a truly scientific miracle, as Thomas Jefferson was not even on the same boat Sally was on. At this point, Jefferson was just done with Calendar. He cut off all communications, but that didn't stop Calendar from going to Madison and trying to bully him for the funds. When Calendar couldn't get his way, what did he do? He did what he did best. He wrote articles that accused Jefferson of fathering Thomas Hemings, who, as DNA has established, has no genetic connection to the Jefferson family. But let's grant that even a broken clock is right twice a day. Was Calendar right? He might have had a little ground to stand on if he didn't show his motivation at the end of his article, writing, When Mr. Jefferson has read this article, he will find leisure to estimate how much has been lost or gained by so many unprovoked attacks upon J.T. Calendar. So this was just a revenge hit piece. From this article, it was a game of telephone among the 1800s newspapers. One newspaper even claimed that Thomas Hemings was Thomas Jefferson's son because Thomas Hemings had a strong resemblance to Thomas Jefferson. A piece of evidence that is still used despite the fact that Thomas has no DNA relation to the Jefferson family. Both pro and anti-Jeffersonian historians who looked into Calendar's story and journalism tactics have described Calendar as an utter scandal monger. They found that Calendar never even visited Sally or Monticello to verify the facts. But if Jefferson was innocent, why didn't he ever deny the story? Because silence is an automatic admission of guilt in America. Guilty until proven innocent. No, that's not how it works. But Jefferson did have a reason for never speaking on this matter. Because it was his lifelong policy to never acknowledge political attacks that weren't true. You know what? Jefferson can do what he wants. He doesn't dignify schoolyard taunts with a response. Yeah, that part of the play was actually accurate. Jefferson believed that acknowledging a lie legitimized it, and if he said nothing, eventually his personal integrity would win out over the lie and people's good judgments would help them see the truth. But he did address the rumors in private correspondence where he basically said the rumor was a bunch of hokum. The evidence for this famous affair is flimsy at best and utterly insubstantial at worst. But then again, it has been over 200 years since this went down. So let me know what you really think happened in the comments. Don't forget to give this video as a hand-me-down to a friend, slather the like button in peanut butter, and click the subscribe button right after you've eaten barbecue. Bye!